Awesome. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, how many people in the audience have heard of the word Kubernetes or heard of Kubernetes? Good amount. Okay, that's that's a little bit better than expected. How about the Cloud Native Computing Foundation? Yeah, that, that's pretty much mo more people know us about you know know, know about Kubernetes than they know about the foundation, but. Um, you know, before I kind of get started, I'd like to define exactly what cloud-native computing is and what, uh, you know, kind of where Kubernetes came from and, and how it ended up at CNCF. So um, there's kind of this interesting picture of, you know, where the industry was the last kind of 20 years when it came to, you know, how applications were developed and how companies collaborated to where we are today. Um, if you recall a long time ago, um, we could even go as far back as mainframes, but you know, I'll, I'll make it simple and kind of we'll start with Sun. People used to just buy machines from like a single vendor. You would deploy your application on there and kind of uh, you know, go, you know, go from there. Uh, things eventually you know, came around where VMware you know, popularized the notion of virtualization. Great, you, know, you get a bunch of VMs on a single machine uh, that you could take advantage to, to write your applications. Uh, AWS eventually came around and popularized the notion of infrastructure as a service. Uh, Heroku came along and did you know, a, a past version, essentially, um, that was popularized and used by many, many people. Um, after that, uh, open source uh, started to come around, and we got open source versions of these things. So OpenStack popularized a version of the OpenStack, you know, uh, IIS. Um, Cloud Foundry essentially did the past equivalent of an open source edition. Essentially, uh, you know, we eventually moved to a model where, um, you know, Docker came around and popularized the notion of containers, right? Um, you know, uh, before that, many kind of companies were using containers, uh, but it was not really popularized until they came around. Um, in 2015, the CNCF was founded, and Kubernetes was kind of seeded as our first project, and we popularized it uh, from, from that point of view. So um, moving today, we're seeing a lot of interesting companies taking advantage of Kubernetes and cloud-native uh, technologies, not only kind of in the traditional sense of scaling their infrastructure, but also using it in unique areas such as the edge and, and, and IoT. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, in 2015, we were founded uh, as a non-for-profit foundation under the auspices of the Linux Foundation. Uh, Kubernetes was our first project, but it was always the intention for the foundation to, to not only host Kubernetes, but related uh, projects. Um, you know, uh, if you, uh, you know, we, we have 100 and 180 uh, organizations total that are part of the foundation, um, you know, from uh, the top, you know, top 10 cloud providers to the world to a bunch of kind of related startups uh, in, this, uh, in this space. Um, I don't know how many people have seen this diagram, but, um, you know, cloud native is a bit of a complicated space. Um, you know, we kind of, uh, from a foundation perspective, we serve as curators of projects and technology. So some of you are familiar with um, Kubernetes. Uh, orchestration is just one part of, of cloud native, but when you operate in a cloud native fashion, you kind of have to rethink of how you, how you do you know, monitoring, logging, device management, and so on. So we've been curating a set of technologies to uh, essentially enable you to kind of you know, begin your cloud native journey. Uh, you're more than welcome to look at this diagram. It sits on GitHub that we kind of actively maintain with the community. Um, so what's kind of unique about Kubernetes and, and our foundation? Um, uh, we are the only open source foundation where uh, all kind of 10 major cloud providers in the world are part of and contributing uh, Kubernetes. Uh, you know, we like to use the analogy that kind of serves as uh, the Linux of the cloud. So uh, all these kind of major cloud providers are supporting it, including AWS, because Kubernetes essentially allows you to uh, be portable and move across these clouds. It's really kind of the first technology that has really enabled, uh, you know, multi-cloud. Um, we have a variety of companies contributing to the Kubernetes code base. Obviously, Google's a major contributor, but we even have, uh, you know, large end users like uh, Zalando, which which is uh, you know, popular here in, in Germany, heavily contributing uh, to, to the code base. And before I, I hand it off to, to, to Marco, you know, why are essentially you know, the, you know, Kubernetes so popular and why are the companies embracing cloud native? Well, it's really all about moving faster. So um, you know, there's been a lot of studies out there, lots of kind of DevOps related reports that basically say uh, you know, companies that deploy faster and recover faster, you know, you know, recover from failure faster is, you know, are operating uh, at a better fashion. And Kubernetes and cloud native technology helps you know, get you there. And that's kind of why we're seeing the embrace of the technology across all different types uh, of interest, 
at different industries. And so uh, without further ado, um, I'll introduce uh, Marco, who will talk a little bit about um, how they're taking advantage of, of Kubernetes in a, in, in a new way. So um, go ahead. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, before I dive into um, how we actually use Kubernetes and what advantages Kubernetes brings to us uh, at Bosch, I want to uh, give you a few details first. What is Bosch IoT Hub? What is it for? So basically, Bosch IoT Hub is one of the key components of uh, Bosch IoT Suite, uh, as it provides device connectivity for um, potentially millions of devices that Bosch produces that are IoT capable. Um, Bosch IoT Hub is completely managed cloud service that is based on open source technologies, mainly on Eclipse Hono and Red Hat uh, on MAS. And um, it supports a variety of, of protocols that enables IoT devices to connect to the cloud, uh, send or upload the messages, um, and forward them to the IoT applications, which will then do something um, meaningful with uh, those, those messages, that, that data. Um, Bosch IoT Hub was built from day one to, um, to uh, be scalable and scale with number of messages and number of devices connected to it. And um, also, for, it was optimized for high throughput. Um, zooming in, um, Bosch IoT Hub is basically just, just a set of um, microservices, which can be um, roughly divided into three layers. Uh, first layer being protocol adapters, second layer, hub core, and uh, on top of that, we have messaging. Um, the protocol adapter layer and hub core are mainly based on the open source technologies Eclipse Hono, which I already mentioned, Leeshin for live M2M support, and Californian for Coop. Whereas the HTTP and MQTT adapters or uh, connectivity is supported by Hono and implemented by Hono. Uh, as we already previously saw, um, we can um, uh, also plug in the Bosch IT gateway um, software. Um, the, the, the hub core provides um, authentication for devices, device registration and management, and also message forwarding to the messaging layer, where we use um, Red Hat technology uh, called OnMass for um, providing us with uh, scalable messaging. Um, OnMass is also itself based on um, open source technologies like Apache ActiveMQ for store and forward, and Cupid, uh, which is basically a dispatch router. So as you see, there's a lot of, a lot of um, microservices here. And the question is now how the Kubernetes comes here into play. And uh, if I tell you that all of these microservices are basically packaged up as Docker containers, then um, it's um, easy to guess that we use Kubernetes here to manage, orchestrate, and operate all these Docker containers and basically build up the IT hub in the cloud. This diagram shows you, um, um, a simplified diagram shows you the deployment of IoT Hub in AWS Cloud. You can see we uh, deploy over three availability zones to provide um, users or devices with high availability. Everything is behind the elastic load balancers. And the uh, cubicles on the diagram are basically the pods. Um, so Kubernetes actually brings us um, a lot of um, um, help us actually to, to cope with the complexity of running uh, a clustered um, setup or clustered uh, distributed software by, by using all the, uh, all the um, um, Kubernetes um, uh, services and pods and deployments and basically encapsulate in a way all the complexity. Uh, some pods are bigger because um, they run multiple Docker containers like for example the uh, messaging or on mass um, layer there and protocol adapters marked with P are smaller because they have only one Docker container in them. So Kubernetes um, basically enable us to uh, only a click on a button, update any of the services if we uh, fix a bug or deploy a new feature or whatever, delete a service, introduce a new service, scale up or down. Um, so basically everything is done on a click on a button and pretty easily. Um, going to the DevOps domain, uh, we integrated uh, Kubernetes technology also in our continuous delivery process. This is also simplified, but basically when a developer does a change, he tests that on Minikube. Minikube is basically a local Kubernetes cluster, single node Kubernetes cluster, which um, you can run on your VM test stuff. 
if the developer is happy, he will push to Git. Git um, update or push will trigger a build. And using uh, uh, Jenkins pipelines, we will um, package up the changes to Docker containers and then update the uh, Kubernetes cluster. Of course, we don't do that immediately in prod. We have two stages, so basically two clusters that uh, I showed in previous slides, which are one-to-one, -one, basically. Um, they are similar, and they are not similar, they're exactly the same, and we can then run uh, t tests, so smoke tests, system tests, also low tests, before we actually pr um, um, bring all the changes to production. One of the topics in distributed applications like this running on the cloud is how, how you cope with logging, how you incrementally um, improve your application by reacting on, on, on problems, on, on errors, how you troubleshoot, how you react uh, on incidents. And um, we, um, we ended up using, um, after um, evaluation of different technologies, we ended up using another technology from uh, cloud native, and, uh, uh, CNCF, cloud native, computing, uh, which is called FluentD, which is run as a daemon set, which means um, every pod, every node has a pod with FluentD, which can be then configured to um, collect the logs, not only Docker logs, but system logs and so on. Question is how you collect all those logs to, to search them. We um, end up using Elasticsearch to um, index them and um, Kibana to, to analyze them, to create um, graphs and so on, basically to search through those logs. So um, putting all this together, there's um, a, a plethora of tools and, and a vibrant community, a lot of examples that you can use to build an easier life with running a lot of uh, microservices, Docker containers in a, in a clustered environment. One thing that I didn't mention, we use COPS, which is uh, Kubernetes operations. It's a tool which basically lets you um, create infrastructure in the cloud. Uh, COPS is for the AWS basically creating your nodes in different uh, availability zones, um, a security group, elastic load balance, everything is uh, encapsulated away. Uh, you just need to provide a YAML file, uh, configure that. One really big, um, uh, big thing about Kubernetes is that it prevents, you, it prevents the vendor lock-in because you can just take your, your Kubernetes setup more or less one-to-one -one, uh, into other cloud provider and use it there. Um, I already said that operating cluster, managing, orchestrating is pretty, pretty, um, pretty easy because all the complexity is encapsulated away from, from developer or DevOps guy. It's easy to update. It's easy to monitor and manage. There are many plugins you can use. And um, as I said, logging is pretty easy once you uh, settle down with the tool set. So that was everything from my side. Cool. Thank you. So Thank questions? you. Any questions?